Hello, and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Guerra, an engineer at IC Pro TV, and with me today is Taylor Fossack, a lead engineer, as well as a guest. How you doing, Taylor? I'm doing well, Cam. Thanks for having me on the show this week. So, we, we have a guest. Um, I would love to have you introduce him. Yeah, I'm very excited to introduce our first ever guest on the Haskell Weekly Podcast. We're thrilled to have him on. Uh, Thank you for joining us today, Matt Parsons, author of Production Haskell. Thanks for joining us. Hi, yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk. So nice. welcome. You're calling us from uh, sunny Denver, and we're talking to you from Florida. So we got like most of the United States covered here. Feels good. <laughs> the important parts, anyway. <laughs> Very true. Well, I don't know. West nope. Coast listeners, don't disregard that. <laughs> <laughs> we love all people. Yeah. We're inclusive here. Um, but yeah, we we are really excited to have our first guest on and particularly talking about this book. But before we launch into that, um, Matt, I feel like you and I share kind of a common history or, or maybe I'm mistaken and just projecting a little bit, but um, you have some Ruby in your background too, right? Yeah, the that's right. language, not the gym. <laughs> my, um, my first uh, real internship was with a, a startup in Athens, Georgia doing Ruby on Rails. And awesome. that's kind of where I got my uh, experience building things out with. Uh, I learned how to build web apps from the um, uh, Michael, H- Michael Hartle's Rails tutorial, and that has kind of poisoned how I look at all web programming ever since then. So <laughs> now whenever I look at evaluating something, it's like, all right, I'm going to build a Twitter clone. We'll see how easy mm-hmm. this is. <laughs> yeah. And that's something that Rails makes super easy. And you say poisoned, but I feel like <laughs> it's probably like Ruby and Rails put such an emphasis on the developer experience making that as nice as possible. And I feel like that's something that Haskell has some room to improve perhaps. So pulling some of that is a good thing. Oh yeah, for sure. I I think I picked up the phrase poisoned actually from, um, I went to RailsConf in 2015 with the company and we got to see Sandy Metz talk. Sandy Metz said that she was poisoned by small talk and was trying to poison Ruby with it too. And as far as I can tell, that's like a a universally good thing to do is to introduce more small talk idioms into your programming language. Yeah. And I I think Ruby was pretty strongly um, inspired or maybe stole from small talk quite a bit. So yeah, it's like to work out from what I can tell. Ruby is this weird combination of Perl and PHP and small talk. And all the Rubyists that really care about programming languages really want you to forget that it's not just small talk. (laughs) They say, uh, don't, don't, don't look at under the covers, you know, <laughs> PHP, you know, that kind of stuff. Leave it alone. Let's yeah. just focus on small talk. That's <laughs> funny. Well, my background's in JavaScript, so, you know, web app programming. Oh, mm-hmm. sweet. <laughs> <laughs> but now we're in Haskell, so that's, that's the good thing. Mostly. Yeah, so uh, since we had this kind of shared background, I'm curious, what draw, drew you to Haskell in the first place? So um, when I first started learning how to program, I was doing Java at the university. And I decided that there were, well, I didn't decide. I found out that there were no Java internships in Athens, Georgia, where (laughs) I was going to school at. So it was like, okay, well, like if I want to get an internship, I need to use a language that other people use. And I asked people in the startup community, the developer meetups, what do people actually use? And it came back that the community in Athens had settled on Ruby and JavaScript with JavaScript being more common, more available, easier to get roles with. So I decided, all right, well, I got to learn JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And I picked up a book called Eloquent JavaScript. And that book has right next to each other, two chapters, one on functional programming and one on object oriented programming. So I read the functional programming chapter and it was mind blowing and confusing, but it seemed pretty (laughs) cool. And I kind of understood it. And then I read the object oriented chapter and it was mind blowing and confusing. And I didn't really feel like I understood it at all. Um, I'm sure most of that, it comes down to JavaScript, not at the time having a good object oriented story. Right. And so the prototypes were very weird for me to understand. Um, but I decided, okay, well, it seems like there are these paradigms. I got to learn the most object oriented programming language and I got to learn the most functional functional programming language. And oh. I looked around and I saw Haskell and everyone kind of decided that Haskell was the functional programming language. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to learn that. It's going to expand my brain. It'll be cool. Yeah. And then I guess for the most object oriented, you went Ruby slash Smalltalk. 
Yeah, Ruby. I haven't actually ever worked with Smalltalk. I've like read about it. I read the mm -hmm. spec. Uh, I tried implementing it in small in in Rust, but it turns out that's really hard. And so I never <laughs> actually got that far with it. Um, but yeah, I decided to do Ruby. Ruby was kind of an easy one to pick because like everyone in the community that was doing startups wanted to program in Ruby. Yeah. I had a similar experience, uh, not in Athens, but in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, although I'm surprised there weren't any Java jobs that seems like kind of the safe bet. Um, but there were definitely a lot of Ruby jobs, very popular with the startup community. Ruby and rails made that type of work. Like you said, write a Twitter clone, you know, it's just tutorial stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the main reason there weren't Java jobs is that Athens is just like a tiny community, only about mm -hmm. a hundred thousand people in the city, and so there just was not a tech scene. Gotcha. I think there were like maybe four companies total, and there's like one or two. There's I think two tech companies based out of Athens right now that are like modestly successful. Yeah, and they're not the big ones like Oracle or you know Cisco something <laughs> like that. <laughs> no, they might have a hundred employees. Yeah. So, so Matt, are you, are you telling me you're a bulldog? Is that what you're telling me here? If you're from I... going to college in Athens, then <laughs> I never went to a football game. People tell me that mm. I'm going to really regret that for the rest of my life. And I still haven't ever felt any desire to go to a football game. I'm so with you was... there, Matt. I went to UT. I was a longhorn. I went to one football game just to say that I had gone and it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a diehard Gator. So, you know, for me, Bulldogs, you know, they're just somebody to beat every year. But, you know, if you ever, <laughs> Matt, if you ever find yourself in Florida in October, you know, maybe we can, you know, go to the Florida Georgia game in Jacksonville. It's pretty sweet. Chomp, that, chomp. that would be one game that would be cool to go to just because you're in a pro stadium. They literally split the field half and half, like, uh, fans. <laughs> so it's kind of neat to see. Uh, but it's also, I wouldn't very... want to be right on that dividing line. Yeah, it's very vicious on that line. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, it's back on the, uh, you know, it's almost like the, the the divide of like functional programming and object-oriented programming, you know? Mm. There you go. That, we need to fill up a stadium. There. There we Which go. one is functional programming? Which one is object-oriented programming? Functional well, obviously, well, the we gators, gators. Oh, yeah. functional programmers. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. Well, I, I think we take the teams out of that one. We, we let that be more of the the uh paradigms that we're, we're really comparing there no no mm. football teams needed <laughs> right but of course yeah but uh awesome thanks for uh kind of sharing that experience so going you went to the two extremes which is you know pretty cool i got st i got started in the middle with you know javascript so it was like which mm -hmm. one do you pick because you can pick either and good luck with or either. both <laughs> at the same time you can just sprinkle them in mm-hmm um, so Matt, clearly the functional side kind of won out. Um, I know it's a really complicated question, but do you have a feeling of why you gravitated toward functional rather than object oriented? Well, yeah. So when I was working in that, um, in the Ruby internship, I ended up finding that it was easier for me to like sketch out a design for a problem in Haskell. And I'd come up with the ADTs. I'd come up with the basic data transformations. I'd write that out in Haskell and then I'd port it all to Ruby. And the code that I wrote that was based on like functional programming paradigms in Ruby ended up being like easy to test, really easy to work with. It was very easy to write, you know, TDD approaches to this highly functional code. And by thinking more along the lines of like data structures and less along the lines of classes and objects and messages, it was a lot easier to like model problems such that the solutions just kind of fell out naturally. Um, right. One of the things that we built at that company was a um, a message tree so that like you could have a text message conversation and based on the answers you gave back, different actions would happen on the back end. Okay. Uh, the mm -hmm. first draft of this was to have an object with mutable state that would update its internal state based on what uh, text messages were received back. This ended mm -hmm. up being really complicated and difficult to work with. So I replaced it with kind of a a try or a tree of possible messages and each level in the tree had a choice of messages that it could respond to. And this right. is extremely easy to express as a nested sum type. Mm -hmm. And you port that over to Ruby and then the whole thing just works really simply and nicely. Mm. Um, 
And so I just kept finding that I was more and more interested in functional programming. Like I never ever modeled a problem in Ruby and then tried to solve it in Haskell. And that's partially because I wasn't solving problems in Haskell. I didn't have a Haskell job. Right. Mm -hmm. But then I got a Haskell internship. My last year I was working with um, Layer 3 Communications out of Atlanta. And I was getting to use Haskell to solve actual problems. And I never once tried to model a problem in Ruby and then put it into Haskell. Yeah, that's telling. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. We so, have a... I just got more and more interested and excited about it. Um, I started giving talks at the Athens developer meetup group about it. Um, and eventually one of the local startups in Athens actually started building out some services in Haskell as an experiment. Ooh. And it came time for me to graduate. I talked with the company. Um, I had a few folks that knew me from the community and they were going to vouch for me. <laughs> and we're like, all right, let's try this out. Let's try to replace more and more of our uh, PHP code with Haskell. Nice. <laughs> So kind Let of me upgrade you. Sense. Cool. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting to me because I feel I have some of the same, um, like I, I programmed in scripting languages, I would say, PHP, Perl, Ruby, that type of stuff for quite a while. And mm -hmm. when I found Haskell, I was really excited because it felt like the kind of natural extension of my brain, like the way that I model problems matches how Haskell wants me to model them anyway. So perfect match. Um, and then you get all these other auxiliary benefits, like you mentioned, they're easier to test, easier to inspect, easier to think about. So, um, yeah, curious to, to have that parallel track going on. Yeah, yeah. I think with, I think with Haskell, the thing that's really incredible is that it has some types and then you're able to say, or yeah, because in every other programming language, except, you know, until very recently, you could only say, and, mm -hmm. and I don't know, like. I have never ever tried to limit myself to only saying and in like my personal life or the communications that I use, but it would be so annoying. Yeah. I can only imagine mm -hmm. how annoying it would be. And then that's kind of how we restrict ourselves in our programming environments. We're saying, all right, well, you're only allowed to say and you can't say mm -hmm. or unless you're literally saying true or false. <laughs> right. right. Only hilarious. for this one data type. Can you say or? Yeah. Yeah. Cam and I were talking about this either last week or a couple of weeks ago, where once you have those tools of some types in general, being able to say this or that, you start to wonder like, how did I accomplish anything before I was able to do this? It just seems crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have Unless the, I'm doing some. Oh, go ahead. I have kind of the advantage of like having learned Haskell within like, well, having started to learn Haskell within about like six months of learning the program at all. And so mm -hmm. I literally don't know how anyone uses that. <laughs> I, I know that there are things like the visitor pattern that you can do to kind of emulate them, but mm -hmm. having never had to actually write that code, it blows my mind. That, it blows my mind that software anywhere works <laughs> for a huge well, amount of reasons. And that's only one of them. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. And I think for me, like my experience, I started coding in college. Like that was my first ever experience even thinking about programming. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, you're learning Java or C++ and like, it's, it's very object oriented. Like there's not a ton of functional programming concepts, at least taught at the program I was in. Uh, and like, you know, once I learned, like I got a JavaScript internship actually here at IT Pro TV, like that's where I started. Um, you know, it, it offered me like a little more flexibility than all the, you know, object oriented programming languages I was used to like C++ and Java. Um, <clears throat> but then thankfully a couple years later, I was introduced to Haskell, well, Elm and then Haskell. And like, uh, yeah, like, like Taylor said, it's just, and like you said, it's awesome to be able to really model things in such an inclusive way. Like mm -hmm. there's so many ways and things, you know, things you can express with Haskell that you just can't clearly express in JavaScript or any of those other object oriented programming languages. Yeah. So Elm was the gateway drug for you. Oh yeah. Matt, you, uh, have you ever used Elm? I have not. Okay. Well, if you're interested in the front end languages, you should try That's it. a good one. It, it's funny. I feel like the Haskell community has kind of a complicated relationship with Elm because yes. on the one hand, for many people, it is a gateway. Like it's a simple version of Haskell that can introduce you to the concepts, but the other side of that double-edged sword is that it doesn't have all the fancy stuff that Haskell has that people that use Haskell really like, like 
like effect systems and monads and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the type class system, not having that, this oh, yeah. really no type tripped classes. me up a lot. And then they have one type class that's called comparable, and you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? So Magic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm familiar with Elm. It seems like a really, like it has the most important features for doing functional programming correctly. Like I wouldn't want it, I wouldn't want to take away some types. I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to take away like pure functions. Uh, and I wouldn't want to take away like generics or type variables or whatever they have. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel yeah. like they have like the most important things for it. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's kind of like take the, on the simplest end, possible. Yes, yes. My take on the front end is that I don't want to do it. And so whatever <laughs> technology will allow me to push that on to someone else, that's the best technology for me on the front end. If I had so, to write my own like interactive single page app, I would want to use probably PureScript. Uh, my experiences with that have always just been extremely positive. Um, great community, great language. Libraries are pretty high quality when they exist. And the editor tooling. tooling, yes, the editor tooling, it just works, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, Haskell is getting there, but it's a slow process. Yeah. You know, I dedicate about um, eight hours a year to trying to figure <laughs> out if the editor tooling situation has gotten any better, and it has not uh, every single year that I've tried to do it. Well, Almost. this year might be the one that it changes. The year of the Linux desktop and the year of the <laughs> Haskell tooling coincide. <laughs> ah, I would love it. <laughs> That's awesome. My problem is that it al it always works fine on small projects. Mm -hmm. And it does seem like the size of a project is uh, increasing before the tooling kind of falls over. But I have received... I I've tried to get it working with the work project at Lumi, and it does not work. What happens is, is it will get through like kind of the beginning of the module hierarchy, all right? Mm -hmm. So the stuff that doesn't have any dependencies, you'll get pretty good feedback. But once we start getting into like... Oh, I don't know. Like the, we have about 700 modules in the project. And once mm -hmm. you start getting into about module 300, 400, the feedback just takes way too long for it to be useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we need is the, uh, size that the tooling is okay with to grow faster than the average size of a Haskell project. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. We'll tip over eventually. I can write Haskell code faster than people can release fast tooling. Unfortunately, <laughs> Just slow down, Matt. <laughs> Problem take care of itself. Right, let's code. Um, well, cool. I appreciate you, you know, giving us some insight into how you got to where you are. Um, I want to turn our attention a little bit now toward the book that you're in the process of writing. I know mm -hmm. that you've been working on it for at least several months now, and you have several hundred pages to show for yourself. But can you uh, tell us about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the book actually started out as a joint project between me and Sandy McGuire. He uh, was going to write uh, all the advanced type level system stuff, and I was going to write another section on like other advanced Haskell techniques. And I was uh, unable to work on the book fast enough, and so he ended up taking his half of it and releasing Thinking with Types. Mm. So I've actually I've had this project on the back burner for a really long time, but I've had a hard time getting started with it until. Um, Really until about August of last year, I was diagnosed with ADHD and started receiving treatment for it. And okay. in the intervening time, I'm up to about 400 and I think 418 pages. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's amazing what executive dysfunction can do or not <laughs> so do. So the treatment is working. Case. Yeah. Wow. But the idea, um, initially I wanted to write kind of a book on intermediate to advanced Haskell that would be useful for someone that had completed something like Haskell book uh, or Haskell from first principles or Graham Hutton's book or some other introductory text and was stuck knowing the language, but not knowing how to actually build something useful with Haskell. Because once you understand monads and maybe monad transformers, you're able to like write code and understand code, but then you're kind of plopped into this ecosystem that's mystifying. Mm -hmm. That is just mm -hmm. very difficult to discover, despite the presence of tools like Google, which given a type signature can give all, or, you know, some things that will implement that type signature. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so this book, I'm really, I'm wanting to say, you can use Haskell in industry. You can make a lot of money with it and it's really cool, but it's tricky. It's different than other systems. It's different than other ecosystems. 
So what I want to do here is say, I don't know like what the best way is, but I've watched projects work and I've watched projects fail. And this is kind of the advice that I have to have your project work. Yeah, I mean, I think it's honestly, the community valuable. needs that. Yeah. Yeah. I think from a, yeah. as a programmer for myself who, you know, works in Haskell day to day and is maintaining, you know, a relatively large project that continues to grow, you know, it, it helps to be able to kind of say, okay, what, what can we improve and why are we going to make these improvements? So I think that would mm -hmm. be really beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Haskell community has a lot of beginner resources. Like you mentioned, you know, Haskell programming from first principles, uh, Hutton's book and the other one, um, learn you a Haskell for great good. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's also a lot of like very expert things like real world Haskell, or like you mentioned, Sandy's book and many, many others. Um, and so I feel like you're filling an important gap here where like, yeah, I can do Haskell in the small, but how do I leverage those skills to produce a system? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the, one of the difficult things about Haskell is that it's attributes as a language. It's so much more productive when it comes to just the act of writing software. That part of being a Haskell developer is so much better. And I am obviously biased um, <laughs> in part because I use Haskell all the time. And also in part because I don't actually know what it's really like to be a professional engineer with any other kind of language. But like, I do think that Haskell is a superpower in terms of software engineering. Um, but that's only one part of the system. Mm -hmm. And so when one part of a system becomes super optimized and super fast, you have to let the rest of the system kind of optimize around this new set point. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, you know, when you're writing concurrency code, if you have a queue and that queue doesn't have um, a limit in its size or it doesn't have any back pressure, the queue can overflow and blow everything up. Yeah. Um, at the, at the first job, we actually witnessed this, um, kind of in the actual performance of the Haskell code and also in how the team was working. Um, I think mm -hmm. I was able to, um, mostly on my own develop a code base that was around 35 to 40,000 lines of Haskell. Wow. And what kind of time frame? Um, I think that was within my first like year of working there. Yeah. Well done. It was pretty burly, but you know, Haskell, it's just so easy to write code that works that it was just for the most part. Also, it helps that I was, uh, to some extent taking existing PHP projects and transpiling or right, porting transcribing them, them, porting them, making them better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we had one system that I wrote and it was so much faster than the equivalent PHP system that when we dropped the new system in, it revealed a lot of performance problems <laughs> in every other component that touched it. We had servers that were falling over because they weren't used to having a, you know, backend server that was responding so fast. <laughs> so we ended up having to actually artificially slow down the Haskell service in order to deal with that problem. Now, eventually a lot more of those services got folded over into Haskell and that made everything right. like a lot faster, but you can't just make one part of a system better and expect the whole system to improve. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's like not, uh, intuitive. It's not something that I think people are, it, it, it's, it's weird, right? Like you expect, okay, well, mm -hmm. I'm going to make one part faster. Everything else should get better. And that's well, or not at the very least, work. everything else should not get worse. But like you, yes, you know, like you lay out in this example, things kind of depend on a particular level of performance. So if you just completely blow that out of the water, they don't know what to do anymore or they fall over or who knows. Right. Yeah. yeah. And on the productivity side of things, um, you know, you might, you might be a 10 X developer if you're using Haskell, but that only applies to the actual code that you write. You mm -hmm. have to write documentation. You have to care about like observability of a feature. You have to care about, you know, continuous integration and testing and all this stuff. And those aren't any faster with Haskell. In fact, I think in a lot of cases, they're slower. Right. Um, integrating with like an error reporting service is something that I've had to do recently. And in every other language, you just like import error reporting service into your like package file. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Crazy then Java metadata hacking happens after that, or like Ruby scripts get rewritten behind the scenes and you just get error reporting. Yeah, Haskell, none of it is pretty, but it just works. 
Yeah, exactly. And, you know, in Haskell, that's not the case. Um, nothing is off the shelf. Nothing just works. You have to thread in everything that you want to care about. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that does, over the long run, give you, like, a better signal-to-noise ratio. But, you know, it's still annoying that we have to put together our own stack traces for exceptions. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> they you, you're striking that. a nerve here because we've been struggling <laughs> with this at our job as well as well where we want to just plug in exception reporting yes but we have to remember like oh we forked a thread here but we forgot to install the exception handler so those have just been thrown into the ether in the meantime mm -hmm. yeah i i've it's a problem that i keep coming back to i want to have a uh exception wrapper type that carries um just a list of like i don't know ease and values just some random metadata you can attach to an exception mm -hmm. but it is so tricky to figure out how to deal with that information because yeah. if you want to do this and you want to attach that information directly to the exceptions well now you have to write a special catch function mm -hmm. that looks at the exception and tries to determine okay well are you what i'm trying to catch or are you a, a version that's annotated with metadata and I need to exactly. preserve that metadata if the exception gets rethrown. We've been struggling. You're you're hitting all the nerves here because we <laughs> have this exact problem, not with arbitrary metadata, but just with the call stack. And it's the you know we have to provide ah. the wrapping and unwrapping and catching and throwing and all this. Mm -hmm. it's, it's painful. And, mm -hmm. and you know, bringing it back to the larger point earlier, we were talking about tooling being bad. And I think one of the reasons that Haskell tooling can kind of get away with being subpar is that. It is such a productive language that you can kind of get away without it until you start getting little glimpses of it. You know, like we've been trying out Haskell language server and for the few minutes that it manages to work for some of us, <laughs> we're like, oh my gosh, this is game changing. I want to do this every day, but then it crashes. It, sorry, I don't want to besmirch each other. It's a fantastic project. We haven't had good luck getting it to work at work. Yeah. Every, like you said, smaller projects, it looks, works pretty well and it's fantastic. And then we try to bring it into our larger project and we just have trouble. But, yeah, you know, we have hope. We're going to continue to try it and, and mm -hmm. do anything we can to help it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do think that you're right and that um, the additional productivity of the language means that we can get away with less IDE support. I actually mm -hmm. have a, a kind of tongue-in-cheek law of the universe. It's... um. The law of conservation of engineering suffering, where if you make one thing nicer, something else will get worse in order to make sure that you're always as unhappy as you can be. <laughs> well, yeah, you always got to aspire to better, right? You know, it's got to always have something to work for. Yep. This sounds like a glass half full, glass half empty type of way. Of things here. <laughs> I'm always a glass half full kind of person. Well, awesome. Um, yeah, you've, you've said so much that I agree with, and I feel like we could spend 30 minutes just talking about each and every little bit of minutia here, but um, bringing it back to your book, it sounds like a fascinating resource and super valuable for the community. Um, I'm, I managed to snag a pre-release version uh, by advertising in Haskell Weekly. Not everyone can do that. <laughs> if other people want to get their hands on this, how can they do it? Well, the book is currently available for sale on LeanPub. And so if you go, I think, to leanpub.com slash production Haskell, that'll bring up the book sale page and you'll be able to acquire it. Uh, if you get it now, you'll receive updates. You'll receive email updates. I'm doing a release about once a month and I'm including a change log in everything I do. You can follow the Twitter account at prod Haskell. And that will also keep you up to date on the status of the book and how things are going with it. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll be we'll, sure to uh, include those links in the uh, show notes. So if you people are, are lazy and looking for something <laughs> to click on, I'll give them. Thank you. That. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, is there anything else you want people to know about you? Uh, like your Twitter handle or where to find you, what you're doing? Oh, yeah. My Twitter handle is Matt of Lambda. Um, and yeah, I'm on the FP chat Slack a lot. So if you have any questions or want help with programming Haskell, hop on there. We'll be able to get you sorted, make sure everything is good and happy. Nice. Um, Excellent. Yeah, mostly though, I'm doing a lot of bike riding. Ooh, yeah. Let's talk about that because I'm also a bike rider. Yes. Um, 
This I, is now I've the done cycling it. podcast. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Maybe we need a spin-off <laughs> podcast. Um, huh, spin it's funny, off. I was I listening to another there. podcast today called The Bike Shed, but it's not about bikes. It's about programming. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's funny. I think that uh, cycling is one of the more popular, like the, the Venn diagram of cyclists and programmers, I think, is almost a circle. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I like it because it's so, um, it's so deterministic. Mm -hmm. I just got an indoor trainer um, that has like a power meter built in. Mm. And training with a power meter is about as objective as like lifting weights at the yeah. gym and that like, you know, exactly how much work you're doing mm -hmm. and that watt number, man, like you add the time dimension to power and it's like the analysis you can do on it is nuts. <laughs> it's fun. Like I've, I've been trying out all these different apps and checking out all these different ways of analyzing your fitness and your freshness and how much you should train. There's so much there. It's so cool. I spend more time looking at charts than I do actually riding my bike. Maybe this <laughs> <laughs> you got to look at the charts while you're on the bike, you know, oh. multitask. <laughs> <laughs> it is a very no, that sounds awesome. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, I think that'll about do it for us. Like I said, there's so much more that we could dig into here, but I get the feeling reading the book will be a good opportunity to dig into some of those topics. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Matt. I hope you had a good time. I've had a great time. It's yeah. awesome having you on the this show. This was fun. Thank you so much. And Cam, you want to walk us out with the, uh, the usual? <laughs> well, one way they can find us uh, yeah. here at Haskell Weekly. You can find us on uh, at the web at haskellweekly.news. Uh, you can also find us on pretty much any social media platform at Haskell Weekly. Um, and obviously sign up for the newsletter if you already have, if you haven't already, that way you can see um, all the great content that the community is creating. Um, and, you know, we've, we've done covered quite a few uh, topics that Matt's even talked about. So, you know, if you're ever interested in, in what's going on in the community, please check out our, and subscribe to the weekly newsletter. Yes, that's the important part. And we are brought to you by our employer, IT Pro TV, the e-learning platform for IT professionals. Uh, and if you go to itpro.tv, you can uh, apply the promo code HaskellWeekly30 at checkout to get 30% off the lifetime of your subscription. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you guys both for being on the show today. It's been a blast. Thank you all for listening. And I'm signing us out at Haskell Weekly. See ya. Peace. <laughs>